Uh, I wish to make a short statement concerning the upcoming Chancellor's Spenton Review and the wider Westminster funding process. Together with my counterparts in Scotland and Wales, we are collectively making statements to our respective legislators, setting out our expectations for more fiscal flexibility to manage the implications of COVID-19, proper involvement in the spending review so we can plan for our budgets, and a fair deal on EU funding. Members will be aware on the 23rd of September, Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced the cancellation of the autumn budget. This marks a departure from the normal convention of two fiscal statements a year, which provide a degree of certainty to the financial process. While this move in itself was concerning, what is of greater concern to the Executive is the continued lack of clarity over the upcoming spending review. Since the announcement of the spending review back on the 21st of July, I have been concerned about the omission of a date by which the process would be concluded. The Chancellor spoke about autumn, but going by previous Treasury statements, autumn can mean anything up to the second week in December. Cancorla, I want to briefly outline why the spending review outcome date is so important to the Executive and to this House. The spending review outcome is the first time that we would get an idea of, the overarching of what the overarching budget envelope will be for the Executive for the coming years. Without that information, it is impossible to plan effectively. The delay in the spending review leads to a delay in the local budget process, making it harder for ministers to plan effectively for the years ahead. This is made all the more acute by the uncertainty around COVID-19. Today, we are collectively asking the British Government for urgent clarity around the timing and scope of the spending review. In a period where future implications of COVID-19 are uncertain, it is imperative that the Government provide as much clarity on the spending review process, the outcome and the flexibility that will be afforded to us, and the COVID-19 to respond to COVID-19 in the current year and within our future budget envelope. This is not a situation unique to our executive. The Scottish and Welsh governments are faced with similar problems in planning for the future. Today, we are collectively asking the British government to provide a full suite of flexibilities we need to manage the unprecedented ongoing uncertainty that we are facing. I recognise for different devolved administrations, this might mean different solutions. For the executive, if we are able to respond effectively to the impacts of COVID-19 in this year and in future years, it will be necessary for us to have flexibility to transfer capital funding into resource budgets. This will allow the executive the agility it needs to respond to changes that will materially impact public service provision. In addition, I am calling for the Treasury to loosen the restrictions around transferring funding from one year to the next. Under the current rules, any underspend over 0.6% of our resource scale budget and our 1.5 per cent of our capital Dale budget is lost to the executive. This restriction does not encourage good financial management and risks year-end surges of spend as departments seek to ensure budgets are maximised. A relaxation of the rules around year-end underspend would allow departments more flexibility to manage underspend. This is especially relevant in a period where the impact of COVID-19 can lead to a disruption in projects, working practices and supply chains. These are limited and logical requests. Cancorla, the concerns that I have outlined are further exacerbated by Brexit. Planning for 2021 will be challenging enough without the further uncertainty surrounding Brexit, uncertainty that is within the British Government's gift to clarify. Some three months before the end of the transition period, we do not have the clarity we need on key issues such as implementing the protocol and replacing EU funding. I have written to Treasury outlining the costs of implementing the protocol and have yet to receive confirmation that those costs will be met by the British Government as they had promised to do. I also await detail on the Shared Prosperity Fund, the much vaunted replacement of certain, for certain EU funding. The one significant piece of legislation that the British Government has produced recently, the Internal Market Bill, represents a power grab on areas of devolved responsibilities. Our devolution arrangements are underpinned by the Good Friday Agreement, an international treaty, so this is an extremely serious development. Today, we are collectively asking for assurances the British Government will provide full replacement funding of EU programmes without detriment to devolution. The issues I have raised today are integral to the Executive's future budget plans and are issues that urgently need resolved. Cancorla, I call on the Chancellor to provide the much-needed certainty that this House requires and that our Scottish and Welsh counterparts need. As finance ministers, we represent over 10 million people, and today we speak with one voice. We are calling for more fiscal flexibility to manage the implications of COVID-19. We are calling for proper involvement in the spending review so we can plan our budgets. And we are calling for lost EU funding to be replaced in full and brought under local control. 
In normal times, this uncertainty would not be helpful, but the lack of clarity is further compounded as we deal with COVID and Brexit. The Treasury must urgently provide the clarity we need. I commend this statement to the House. Thank you, Gordon Maggot. And I call Steve Egan, the chairperson for the Committee for Finance. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for his statement and also for meeting with me earlier today to talk about these issues. I think it's very clearly that um, as COVID impacts on all of us in Northern Ireland, we need to understand how we have flexibility and we need to get clarity. The question I would like to ask the Minister, will he commit to be working very closely with the Finance Committee to look at the detail and the understanding of this information that's come through? particularly when it looks to moving and transferring of monies within budget, bearing in mind sort of the past record we have had in Northern Ireland on these transfers within budget, and also more details on the Shared Prosperity Fund. And finally, as speaking as the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, I welcome the fact that the Minister sees the benefit as being part of the Union and dealing directly with our Chancellor, who has been having to spend a considerable amount of resource in dealing with the challenges of COVID. Thank you. Well, can I say I'm happy to cooperate as, as I have done with the Finance Committee uh, and, and provide them with the information that they require and that we require. The problem is that we don't have that yet. We don't have that certainty around flexibility. Uh, flexibility is always beneficial, but in the year that we're in, where we not only have the uncertainty around COVID and the ability of departments to spend money that we supplied to them in the budget, but we have an additional about £2.2 .2 billion to date of COVID money to spend within the financial year. So that places a very significant pressure on departments to spend and therefore that type of flexibility would be uh, very helpful. We are not certain yet as to what the outcome may look like uh, once we move into the new year, but we want to be prepared to manage any pressures that we have. In relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund, we have, as I say, quite a lot of good words and goodwill in, in relation to what it may look like, but no certainty around that at all. And we are particularly alarmed at the, the clause within the Internal Market Bill that looks as if uh, it, it would rest with Whitehall in terms of allocating that funding to specific projects here. We have a very clear view, as is Scotland, as is Wales, and that's the view of our executive here, that the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund would be administered and allocated by the executive through its various departments and partners uh, that we have in terms of, of allocating currently EU funding, uh, and that, that must be adhered to. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to rise to the point that he makes as the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. When Sinn Féin get up and talk about these issues, we're accused of politicising COVID, uh, but yet we, we, we are constantly lectured about the, the benefits of the precious union. Well, let's see how it works out in the time ahead. I call Paul Flute. The Minister makes several requests to the Government, none of which I could disagree with, but when he calls for proper involvement in the spending review, the same could be said of this Assembly and the Finance Committee which ha when, have, when having proper involvement in the Executive's budget process. The Department has, uh, over the last few months, showed how and proven how agile it can be in delivering and spending additional monies in year. Mr. Speaker, there is no excuse for the current delay in the budget process and the lack of detail being provided to the committee and indeed this House. The Minister may be right when he says he has no idea what could be in the spending review, but he is always proving that he has no clue in bringing forward a budget to this place. When will the Minister publish details on the budget? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm perhaps as confused as maybe most people are listening to you. On the one hand, I'm saying clearly we don't know what the font envelope is. We're not absolutely certain whether we're into a three-year resource budget and a four-year capital budget. We've been told that's the case, but there are other signals that come out of Treasury say it may not be the case. Uh, and so in that context, he wants me to provide a budget. And that's the reason I'm outlining to the House, uh, if that's the sort of budget he wants, it will be a, a made-up one. Uh, we hope we, we know what we have. Or does he want us to pursue Treasury to get the certainty we need to allow us to plan, hopefully for the next three years in terms of resource and the next four years in terms of capital, and to get that as early as we possibly can, and in doing so then go out to consult with his committee and other committees and consult generally in relation to a draft budget and have one produced in legislation here in the springtime. That's the normal process for a budget. Our concern is that I'm not sure why the member doesn't understand that. He's been on the Finance Committee for long enough. Uh, our process here is to get certainty around the funding envelope. That comes from London. If that certainty isn't there, then that makes it difficult uh, for us to plan. That's not unique to us. 
That's the conversation I'm having with the Scottish Finance Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister. They're experiencing exactly the same problems in giving budget certainty to their own institutions, and that's why collectively today we're making this statement. And I call on Melissa McHugh. Carla, I guess, uh, but I'd also just be as a Yanni for you to rat his fast. I'd like to thank you, Minister, for your statement as well. Uh, Minister, it is important that the executive can plan its budget over a number of years. Is it your understanding that the Treasury still intends to set a multi annual budget of three years resources and four years capital? Well, that's certainly our hope because uh, in terms of our own budget spend, we have operated for the last number of years on annual budgets, and that doesn't give any long-term certainty, particularly in capital projects. And we have very significant capital projects here uh, that the executive uh, want uh, to get on with that are flagship projects that will make a huge difference in terms of economic recovery and economic regeneration right across the region. Uh, and so the, the certainty that a three-year resource budget and a four-year capital budget gives us and gives uh, not only us, but the industry, uh, the construction, uh, all, of the, all of those sectors, then, is very, very important. We had been operating on the basis that was the case. There were signals then come out of Treasury, because there's a confused picture there, that it may not be the case. I raised that directly the other week with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. He said that's the basis on which they're operating, uh, which is, I suppose, certainty of a type, uh, but not the certainty that we want. And that's why we intend to engage directly with them to get that certainty. It's impossible for us to plan ahead if we don't know even the time frame, uh, much less the fund envelope that we have. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for um, coming to the Assembly today. Could I ask him to be a little more specific about the two flexibilities he seems to be asking for? Um, uh, he, um, he's mentioned both um, uh, in-year flexibility around capital resource switch and also carry forward to spending in the next financial year. Can you be slightly more specific about what he is actually specifically asking the Treasury for in relation to that? And secondly, can I ask what specific correspondence he has had with the Chancellor or anyone else in the UK government about uh, paying for about mitigation costs and paying for the costs of EU exit? Well, can I can say what, what we want in the first instance is the principle of flexibility to be agreed, uh, and we haven't had that agreed. Uh, we don't know uh, because at the moment what level of flexibility we might need, and some of that is the conversion uh, of, of capital to resource. Uh, and some of that is the uh, flexibility to extend into the next financial year. Departments are very busy trying to spend out uh, COVID money they have and to spend out their budgets. We have an October monitoring round exercise going on at the moment, and of course we have a January monitoring round scheduled as well. So when we get to those stages, we will know, I think, the degree of flexibility we might require in terms of uh, transferring money between resource or capital and resource and also carry over into the next financial year. We will have greater clarity, but the principle in terms of flexibility is one that we need to establish with Treasury, and that is why we are pressing that very hard. I did send a, 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 a cost to the, uh, the, the Treasury in relation to the, the cost of the protocol uh, and EU exit. They have said that they are going to look at the business case of that. I know DERA are providing additional figures in relation to some of the costs that they will have. Uh, responsibility for. They have said they will meet those costs in full, but yet we have no firm commitment in relation to the costs that we have sent them. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, I fully support all efforts that are being made to ensure that we have the necessary financial firepower here in this place to safeguard both lives and livelihoods. And the measures outlined, if we are granted them, will be welcome. But what efforts are being done to establish a fiscal council? It was a commitment, a new decade, new approach, and it's important that there is oversight of their finances in Northern Ireland as we enter an even more difficult period over the winter. Yeah, as I have told the House on a number of occasions, the, uh, new, the fiscal council is a new decade, new approach commitment, which we will meet. Uh, as with a lot of departments and the commitments under new decade, new approach, things have slipped because of COVID and the, 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 the uh, necessity to, for all departments to focus entirely on meeting the challenges that COVID has presented. But we have already begun again the work in relation to Fiscal Council. I hope to be able to bring a proposition to the Executive very soon. I am also looking at the idea of a Fiscal Commission, uh, and I hope to bring proposals in relation to that in terms of looking at additional uh, tax varying powers that this Assembly might have, as has happened in Wales and Scotland, uh, and to bring a proposal on both matters in the very near future. I call Paul Given. 
Can I welcome the announcement um, of the three ministers in our different component parts of the United Kingdom, uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, speaking with one voice on this issue, and I have some sympathy for the minister in, in seeking certainty and, and more clarity around the budget. In doing that, the minister is asking uh, for more fiscal flexibility uh, to manage the implications of COVID-19. How concerned is the minister that in seeking greater flexibility to access more schemes, that that uh, effort is being undermined when Treasury can look at, for example, the SDLP minister, who failed to access Treasury funding that would have furloughed staff and TransLink, saved the executive millions of pounds, which has been starved from other businesses, not least in the North West, that could be accessing that financial support? Well, I'm not going to involve myself in any critique of the uh, Infrastructure Minister's uh, responsibilities. That's a, a matter for herself and her department. I have to say that uh, in terms of the arguments we are making, there are very general arguments in terms of budget planning, uh, managing the finances that we currently have. Uh, we have consistently, I have consistently, and I'm talking again at lunchtime today to the Finance Ministers from Scotland and Wales, and we have consistently uh, expressed these messages and others uh, to the uh, Treasury. Our concern in relation to that is heightened by the fact that there is now not going to be a budget in the autumn. Uh, our concern is heightened in relation to EU funding by the, the clauses within the Internal Market Bill, and that is why we felt we have had to speak today with one voice to reinforce the messages that we have been consistently given. So these are in relation to very high-level issues that face our administration here, but also Scotland and Wales, and we are trying to press home the need for a broad level of, of uh, fiscal flexibility to assist us in managing our budgets. I call Sean Lynch. Can the Minister give us an indication of the scale of the EU funding and the parts he's trying to protect, Graham Margaret? Yeah, I think the, to the total scale, and this is between 2014 and 2020, is in the region of €4 billion. Euros, uh, now, uh, some of that uh, would fall in under uh, what with our ongoing uh, programme in terms of Peace Plus, which takes up what would have been the peace funding and the interreg funding, and that currently sits about, uh, the proposition for that is around 650 billion, and that is a fund which will con continue to be delivered locally. The rest of that funding is uh, made up of, of uh, the placement of CAP, uh, which goes on to next year, but also a range of other EU funding, I'm sure the member will be very familiar with. Uh, and w our, our concern is in relation to that, that the promise was that we would have full uh, access to that amount of funding that, that we previously had, but also that we would have the ability to design the programmes for that, to allocate those, to work with our own local partners here in doing, doing that. The, the, the intention of the Internal Market Bill seems to take us in a different direction, which I think is very concerning, and we intend to press that point with the British Government. Paul Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Finance Minister for his statement to the House this morning. Obviously, COVID-19 has uh, created unprecedented challenges to, both to um, the budget and particularly uh, health and economy. Um, the Minister may be aware that the Royal College of Surgeons made a call um, asking for ring fencing of beds to allow uh, essential surgery to continue through future waves of COVID-19. Can I ask the Minister what plans his department has in, in conjunction with the Health Department to ensure the necessary funds are in place to allow that uh, essential surgery to continue and to address waiting lists going into the future? Well, can I say to the member that uh, she will know from previous statements I've made to the House that we have uh, centrally held £600 million uh, pounds, uh, for the Health Department. They have been making their own assessments in relation to what they need in terms of response to the pandemic, and obviously that assessment will have increased given the, the resurgence uh, in the, the, the uh, prevalence of, of, of COVID in the community. Uh, and also uh, an element of that was to, to try and assist in redeveloping and supporting other health services. So there's a significant amount of money. This £600 million is on top of, I think, in the region of 300 million of COVID money we've already given the health department and on the budget that health got at the, at the, in March, at the end of March, which is obviously the largest uh, departmental budget of all. So there is a significant amount of resource there, but I recognise, as, as she will, that health is recovering from nine years of austerity uh, and is, is deeply under-resourced and has consistently been under-resourced, so we're trying to meet that challenge. So we have ring-fenced that money. Uh, the health department are going to come forward with their spending plans for that. That has to be spent within this financial year, that $600 million. Uh, if, if all of that is not required, then some will be returned to the centre for other distribution, but it is a significant amount of money uh, on top of the budget that Health already had got. 
I call Gemma Dolan. Minister, one of the reasons it has been difficult to provide extra financial support for workers during the COVID crisis is the lack of tax data. Do you agree that if we had more tax powers and more tax information, we could do more to help our constituents? Well, I think we have been restricted by the fact that uh, if we wanted to do specific tailored programmes for uh, workers here in particular, then that, that, that data is held by HMRC. Uh, and so in order, to, in order to devise any scheme to assist people uh, with uh, the employment costs, then we would have to have HMRC to work with us to verify uh, any claim that has been put forward. And that's a very challenging exercise to get them to do that, specifically for a bespoke scheme uh, for here. I know that uh, other departments have looked specifically at schemes to support uh, employees. Uh, we obviously had the furlough scheme, which is now due to run out at the end of this month, and there's a further employment support scheme, which in my view is not uh, anywhere in approaching the same level of support for um, uh, employees uh, and employers, and I think we'll see uh, increased redundancies. But uh, undoubtedly, the more data that we would have access in, the more levers we have in terms of raising our own finances, but also the more ability we have in setting programmes which are specifically tailored to the needs of people who live here. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, uh, for coming. Uh, Minister, uh, one area where there has been no guarantee of funding is around the employment and skills support in Northern Ireland, currently funded by the European uh, Social Fund. As yet, there is no clarity on how and when this funding will be replaced. Uh, what exactly are the is the Department understanding to talk to affected sectors to understand the real pressures? They are under. Well, I think that the, in terms of that skills and employment, the, the uh, propositions would be brought forward by the Department of the Economy, who have a responsibility there. My job, on behalf of the executives, is to try and secure the funding. Uh, and that's why it's not only important that we, we secure the amount of funding that would have come here through, uh, in, in other circumstances uh, through Europe, but, but obviously, as we've been taken out of Europe uh, against our wishes, we have to try and secure that funding. The British government have promised to replace it in full. But we also have our own unique circumstances, which I think he has recognised in terms of the levels of support and where we want to target those levels of support in terms of skills, particularly with younger people, uh, training, apprenticeships, all of those things. Uh, and we therefore need to have the ability to, I think, manage our own schemes, to allocate and administer our own schemes and make sure they go uh, where they're most needed. Uh, and so those are key principles. But the level of support and the engagement with that sector in terms of devising those plans would be a matter for the Department of the Economy. I call Meg Nesbitt. Speaker, in terms of lost EU funding, I'd be grateful if the Minister could clarify exactly who he envisages taking local control. Is it you know, son of SEUPB? Is it the SIB? Is it, is it himself? And in terms of replacing it in full, were we not told we'd be better off outside of the European Union? So would he accept his position lacks a certain ambition? Well, I, I'm going on the statement that was provided in terms of replacement and fall. And of course, we were told, uh, perhaps sold a pup, uh, not, not those of us who voted to remain, uh, that, that it would be a net gain for the British state in terms of the contribution it's making to you that it would be able to give back into, we, we saw the writing on the side of the bus, that it would be able to give back into public services here. Uh, and if there's to be more than replacement in full, then I'd be very happy with that. Uh, but that's the statement that has been given in terms of replacement in full. Uh, who administers that? I, I think what we want to make sure that we have the shared pr prosperity fund, and then it's, I think it will be up to the executive to design programmes around that and, and, and give it to the appropriate uh, department of course to administer of course finance have a role and we we have a role in relation to seupb but that's a cross-border body as he will know uh, irish government uh, and through the department of finance uh, and the other departments there have a role in that as well and that's a specific, specific program which relates to the six counties here and the six border counties uh, the shared prosperity fund i would imagine will probably be more internal to the north uh, and, and what we want to do in the first instance is ensure the replacement in full of funding, but also that principle that the, the devolved uh, administrations are responsible for the, the design of the programmes and the allocation of that funding and the, the partnerships. And I, I would look forward to as broad a range of partnerships uh, from my own perspective uh, as we can with councils and with other social partners in terms of designing and administering those programmes. Well,
Kankoria, and um, I welcome the Minister's statement today. The Minister has referenced the Internal Market Bill, and I know he and the Scottish and Welsh Finance Ministers have already raised their concerns in relation to it providing financial powers to Westminster over and above the Assembly and Executive. But what impact does the Minister assess the Internal Market Bill will have on our ability to control our spending? Gormagut. Well, the, it's, the concerns are in relation to, as I say, there is a principle attached in terms of the level of funding because we've been told that we would receive it in full. The other, the, the internal market bill has given the British government powers to administer those schemes, uh, and that seems to contradict directly the commitment which was understood by ourselves and by Wales and Scotland that the devolved administrations would get that share of the funding and that we have responsibility for designing and administering those programmes and involving whatever uh, partners that we, we, we would choose to and obviously targeting that money in, in, in to match executive priorities and uh, government priorities here. So those powers that are now being uh, put through a clause in that Westminster Bill seem to contradict that. Uh, and that, I think, is very worrying for not just ourselves, uh, but clearly in my ongoing dialogue with the finance ministers in Scotland and Wales, very worrying for them also. Uh, so we want to ensure that that understanding which we have, that commitment, that principle that we have in relation to the devolved administrations is met uh, by the British government uh, uh, and that the power to uh, decide these programmes and to allocate that fund is not something that's done from Whitehall. That's clearly in contravention uh, of what we have agreed. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, can you give us an assessment of uh, your assessment of the current situation and how it impacts on the Department of Health's ability to deliver services, importantly in this second wave of COVID, and if you've started any conversations with Whitehall in regards to funding for the next financial year? Well, the, the, the conversations with Whitehall in terms of the spending review would lead you into that conversation of not only the next financial year, but the, hopefully the next three years in terms of resource and the next four years in terms of capital. And that's why I think we want uh, as much clarity. Traditionally, uh, the, the, the devolved administrations haven't been involved in, sp in the spending review conversations, but the fact that there isn't an autumn budget, I think, uh, then uh, increases the importance of early sight of what the spending plans are uh, and the time frame for those spending plans and the funding envelope that we'll be operating for. And that will give us the kind of clarity to plan in the way that, uh, that you're alluding to. Uh, I, I can't make the assessment uh, because that's an assessment for the health department. Uh, what I do know is that the executive have prioritised health even before COVID became a factor in, in terms of our dealing, even in the discussions we're having around the the reinstitution of the executive, uh, there was an agreement among all the parties that health would be a priority for us all. So we have done that in terms of the budget allocation and in terms of the COVID allocations, we have added a significant amount of money to health. And uh, as I said in an answer earlier, we had some 600 million health centrally for health that they are making an assessment in relation to COVID response, but ongoing support uh, for other health services, uh, uh, and that we expect to be able to announce fairly soon what they require of that, and if anything then is able to be returned to the centre for further allocation. I call John O'Dowd. I can't call you. It actually follows on from Mr Nesbitt's question, this, this elusive savings, which were associated with, with Brexit, and what is clear now is actually going to cost public administration money to deal with Brexit. How is the Minister's Department going to have to deal with, or are dealing with the additional costs associated with this, with this Brexit? Uh, we have done our business plan in relation to what we uh, are estimating our costs uh, of implementing the protocol, and there are uh, costs implementing the protocol. The Treasury have said they will meet those costs, but they have not yet committed to agreeing the figures that we sent to them. I know they are doing further work in relation to the figures associated with their particular element of that. Uh, but you're right, there, there is a cost to implementing the protocol. There will be a cost, uh, undoubtedly, on this island, uh, economically, in terms of Brexit itself, which is very hard to quantify and to see what the final outcome of those negotiations are. It could be a very severe cost. It might be less severe, but it's going to be a cost one way or the other. Uh, and, and clearly, the, the promise, I think, that, that uh, Mr Nesbitt alluded to of not only would we have that funding returned, but there would be much more funding uh, to spend across public services here hasn't seemed to have materialised in any dialogue that we've been having with Treasurer. And I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Um, I suppose the Treasury is always an easy target for devolved institutions, maybe not always a matching acknowledgement of the scale, particularly during COVID, of financial assistance. 
But on the point about the capacity to transfer from capital to resource, is the Minister looking for that only during the COVID emergency or as a long-term change? And if it's a long-term change, would that require any legislative change? Well, I think, I think it would be more beneficial to have a long-term change because he will know from his experience here, and most members will know who have been here long enough, we do get into a situation from January to March where there's a, a kind of spending surge. Uh, and the question is, of course, the, 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 the dynamic behind that is we don't want to surrender money back to Treasury because we're always criticised, departments are criticised for not spending out money. Uh, and so the, the, you, you quite rightly get asked the question, are we spending on the right things? Are we planning sufficiently? Are we just spending to get rid of the money because we've been criticised for not spending it? And does that have the proper uh, positive outcome in terms of long-term outcome we have? So I think a longer-term flexibility in relation to all of that would be beneficial. Uh, I think we will have that discussion with Treasury whether that requires legislation or not. Uh, but uh, and, uh, I'm happy to do that in, in terms of taking that forward. But I do think it would be more beneficial to us in the long term rather than just we have a particular situation this year because we have additional money from COVID. And I have acknowledged in this chamber uh, from an Irish Republican perspective uh, how I feel the COVID allocations from Treasury have been beneficial. I felt the furlough scheme was very beneficial. The loan scheme that we have to business was very beneficial. But we are taxpayers. So if, if Treasury is distributing its largesse around those who pay into the, the British Treasury, then we're entitled to some of that as well. Uh, but I think it would be much more beneficial for us in the long term, because we are in a cycle, and we have been, particularly with annual budgets, where we end up in a spending splurge at the end of the year. And I don't think that's good for long-term planning. I don't think it's good for the best use out of limited public funding, which we have. Uh, and I think it would be much better done in the long term. Whether that requires legislation or not would be a matter that we'll explore with Treasury. And members, that concludes questions on the statement. And could I ask members just to take a raise to be prepared the chamber for the next item on the order paper? Thank you.